So, I've, uh, so I'm Sean, by the way. That's why I'm standing up here. Um, I work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which thankfully is a pretty close drive through the beautiful Baraboo Valley to get here. Um, and I have the pleasure of talking to you today about games. Uh, my background was in education. I taught for 10 years, and I was a principal in northern Minnesota for about three years. And then they asked me if I wanted to study games for a living, and I said, sure, why not? <laughs> um, so in the process, I'm there getting my PhD under Kurt Squire, who also studies games in the classroom. Uh, I was just made aware that this is called an advanced presentation, um, which doesn't meet with game design theory. Every game is fun, so I would like you to encourage, don't be too intimidated by the advanced recognition. But I am going to skip a couple topics today because there's a lot of, uh, almost a field of games research that's growing, uh, even in the last five years. And there's a few of the big, huge topics that we're just not going to address in this session. One of the big, huge topics is, don't video games make kids violent? Uh, and the answer is no, and there's a lot of research that shows that, but I'm not going to take time going through that today. Um, the second big one that comes up is, won't games just be a disruption and take too much time in my classroom? The answer is, well, they do take time, and they are disruptive, but they're not disruptive in the way that, that's bad. They're kind of disruptive in the way that it's good. In fact, they're disruptive in a way that gets kids' interests very quickly. So I'm going to jump right to some other topics, which is where the field is interested in looking right now. So before I do that, um, let me uh, outline a few of the big people. I'm a, a, I'm a grad student, so what I'm kind of doing today is show and tell, which is fun for me. I get to show you what's going on around the country when it comes to games research in the classroom. There are other folks that have been working on this much longer. Uh, Michael Horn and, and Disrupting Class talks about how schools are going to be changed. Uh, that's another huge topic in this area that I'm not really going to address. But here's where I come down on that. I think games are part of a teacher's toolbox. They're one of the things that great teachers pulls out of their toolbox to use in the classroom. And I also think that the way we design games today is so captivating and engaging and fun that it, it would be silly for schools not to look at that as, as the design principles of games to redesign how they do things. Um, so, but there are other folks that, that, that feel that games are actually going to take over how we do school and that teachers are essentially great game designers too. Um, because ultimately school is kind of a game. We have levels, we have points, uh, we have wins and losses. Uh, and ultimately, we want everybody playing the game just like game designers do in the industry. Uh, so there are some great books up there. This slideshow will also be on my website, so you can grab the names of these books off the slideshow later on if you want to. We'll come back to them. Uh, the second thing, when I talk about games for the next few minutes with you, and we, we discuss those, I'm talking about specific kinds of games. I'm talking about games that are digitally mediated, uh, that, where they take interesting problems and they make them fun. So those sorts of games are proliferating the market. The games industry in the last three years has outproduced or out the income, the profit of games, has been greater than Hollywood and the music industry combined. Part of that is that movies and music, you can hit copy and paste on them very easily. So the value of movies, music, anything digital that you listen to or watch are things that we can copy and send to our friends so the value of those products are going down, supply and demand. And if it's that easy for me to make another copy, it's very easy to pass them around. Thus, Napster and TV Shack and some of those things are really destroying those industries. The other part of it is that games are really fun. And I hope that there's some gamers in Is there anyone in the room that calls themselves a gamer or would admit to it in front of a group of people? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've been a gamer since I was 10. Back when I was 10, back in my day, we could go into bars when we were 10 years old, if you went during the daytime. And bars were where games first showed up. So I would steal into the bar with a roll of quarters, and I would keep plunking them in and play them. So I was one of those really rare people that actually liked losing a lot. So one of the things I've, I talk about is losing and how games use loss mechanics. But this year, I'm going to do something different. What's exciting is that we've hit a tipping point when it comes to games. According to Pew Internet Research, American Life and Family Research folks, we hit a number of 97% 97, 97 of kids between 8 and 18 play games at least once a week. They're regular gamers. In other words, we have an entire generation coming through the system right now that not only plays games, but they're very familiar with the kind of language that games have in them. And when you read or speak that language, some other languages don't make as much sense, as with any discourse. So these are kids that are demanding a certain kind of environment that they can interact with. They are lean forward people when it comes to technology, not lean backward people. 
They like to do technology, not receive technology. These sorts of uh, people come into the classroom and they don't really understand the kind of game that's being played in the classroom, so they bring with them other things to help keep things rich and fun and stimulating. Uh, this can be exciting or this can be disturbing depending on how you look at it. We're going to also skip over that just a little bit. Games are changing things. Uh, games have become a, a mass market kind of product. And here's the good news, the way we design games is not that hard. Uh, game designers have a formula. There's about 11 game mechanics that make a game fun. And the study of fun has advanced enormously through digital technologies over the last five years. That's what we're going to look at today. What makes something fun? And how do you do it? Here's the second angle that we're going to take today. I also want to look at or, or, or play with the thought that maybe when we ask teachers to do games in class, without providing any methodology for how to do that or any means or ways to do that, we're really asking a lot of teachers. And that's not really fair because we spent four years in college getting our teaching license learning how to teach a certain way. You know, the Madeline Hunter, students will be able to do this and then you can do guided practice, independent. Well, all those terms were invented and all those terms mean something to teachers. Well, I, oh yeah, check for understanding, sure I can do that. Um, anticipatory sets, we have words that we use for how we teach. I would suggest to you that the technology of a book is a very different technology than the technology of a digitally, digitally stimulated, simulated experience or a game. That those are both technologies where you receive something someone else wrote or designed with all the biases that come with that but they're very, there's going to be different ways to teach with those tools, and we haven't yet invented the language for that, but we're going to try to start playing with it today, if that's all right. Because here's the other fun thing. I get the joy and the privilege of traveling around the country, not only sharing these things with people like you, but I get to go into individual teachers' classrooms and watch them happening as they're happening. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson argues that what's happening in education is nothing short than a revolution. We're just in the middle of it, and it's just getting started. Um, and, it, and he announced that on Monday this week. Uh, Bernie Trilling, who wrote 21st Century Skills and Practices, also argues that within 20 years, we won't, in leadership positions throughout schools in this country, we'll have digital natives, not digital immigrants. <laughs> um, so even people like me that played Pac-Man in a bar when I was 10, I still consider myself a digital immigrant. I don't really speak Twitter, but I'm learning. Um, so those sorts of things are all happening at once. We're just going to pick the one angle of those, which is games, which is kind of fun. I have to confess to you, I'm kind of a game geek myself. It's what I do in my spare time. So now that it's part of my work, I work enormously long weeks, and I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just part of what I do. So I'm kind of, I, I feel especially privileged and blessed by that. Um, and I appreciate uh, your interest in it, too. You're sharing some common interests with me. Uh, so here's what's different. Games are simply a very complex tool. Uh, as opposed to reading, where essentially the guts of reading is that I'm taking someone else's flow of thought and I'm putting it through my brain, right? That's reading. Reading without a teacher, however, is entertainment. Are you following me? When a teacher gets involved in reading, something really cool happens. We take that flow of someone else's thoughts through a kid's brain, and we ask kids not only to process what those thoughts were, but re-envision and re-represent those thoughts to other people. We ask them to tell out what they read. And it's that processing process that is, makes reading as entertainment into reading as school. The tool never changed. The books don't change. What changes is what the teacher does with that once the kids had the experience, assuming they read the book. If they don't read the book, that's a problem. Well, there's kind of a motivational problem if they don't like to read books. With games, we don't have that problem. They can still put someone else's thoughts through their brain but when we just drop games into classrooms as these tools that we think will do something by themselves, we're really ignoring the fact that teachers do something magical when they ask the kid to take that gaming experience, re-represent it, and represent it to other people. To make meaning of their experience is essentially what happens. Any learning tool does that and does it really well. So let's start looking at how that might happen. I would suggest to you there's four levels. And I'm using the term level because it's kind of games. I'm also using the term level because I'm not sure if these are developmental, if they happen all at once, if they're different ways to do things. But I would suggest this, that the teachers I talk to um, are expressing that there's certain benefits to games that they use, even the ones that don't play games themselves, and that you don't have to be a gamer to teach using these strategies. Uh, so let's go through a few of them. The simplest and easiest, most accessible, is to be able to talk about games with kids. 
Uh, great teachers have always thought that finding the hook with a kid is a real asset. And if that hook is to talk about Harry Potter with a kid when they're all passionate about Harry Potter, then at some point I got to break down and read Harry Potter. And when I was a middle school teacher, yes, I put myself through that. And I was su pleasantly surprised with the fact that they weren't that bad of books. However, I kind of got stuck at book six because the movies were coming out and I thought I can just get the shortcut. <laughs> so I decided to cheat the system a little bit. But one of the greatest assets for teachers that do anything with games is simply the ability to talk with kids that are sold out gamers. They're geeks. They're the ones that will raise their hand in the room. And they want to talk about games with you, whatever those games might be. Great questions for teachers that don't game themselves might be, what computer games are you playing? I'm looking at games in the classroom. What are some games that I have to play to know anything about computer games? And those conversations can be really animated. When I see this happen in a classroom, it looks a lot like when I went to Mexico and I found someone that spoke English. You know that reaction that people have when they're like, oh, you speak English. Now we can talk. So even asking a question of a student that plays games helps you use games in the classroom. It becomes an asset for the teacher. Um, and that's probably the shortest need is Here's another one if you're scared of using games in classrooms. Um, what if games were simply another model to do extra credit? What if you don't want it to disrupt your lesson planning right now, but you allowed kids to turn in things from their games for extra credit? You're asking them to represent their games in new ways to you. So a way you might do this is to say, after you teach a lesson, are there any computer games out there that might be associated or have anything to do with the ideas we just talked about in class? And let your students start guiding you towards some games. Now here's where we're going with this. Extra credit then can turn into something else. It can actually be an option. So you can hand me an essay, a digital movie, uh, um, an acted scripted poem, or you can do a module of a video game and hand that in. And it simply becomes another thing that you allow into your classroom as a turn-in model. So those are really non-digital, quick, easy ways to use gaming if you're not a gamer. I think that the more teachers do that, and from the more teachers I talk to, these are the kind of the three entry points into games. I'm going to give you one more, and then we're going to start some show and tell. Because for each of these categories, I, I really want you to get a chance to see what this looks like and to be as excited as some of the researchers are about some of the things we're seeing. What if, as a teacher, what I want for my students is unique experiences, but I'm OK with the idea that I might not be the one that presents that experience. I'm simply there to help them reprocess and transform that experience and build meaning from it. What if those, new, uh, those meaningful experiences had them going out into their community, going to places and seeing things in kind of a different way? Well, how would you do that? The reality is, uh, one of the things we've done at the University of Wisconsin, uh, and Milk I put up there because there are another folks that, that do it, is we take basically the map structure that's already built out there and we can build games on top of that. So Dave Gagnon, Chris Blakesley, myself, John Martin, some other researchers at the university, we started making these mobile games. Um, and um, what happened was teachers would say, these mobile games are really fun, but I can never do them in my class. So I would call this an addition. This is something you might add as extra credit. And I would suggest that these are things you can build. What the Eris engine is, is an, Air, an engine you can get. And OK, we're grad students. So we don't have it up for the Android yet, but we're working on it. Right now, you can get it on iPad or any of the iPhones or the iTouch. And you can rent those out through a library system or whatnot. And kids can go out and do mobile experiences in your neighborhood. So if you want to look at civic engagement or politics or urban renewal processes or anything like that, you can just go grab Eris for free and build your own games. It will take you about an afternoon to go through the tutorials and make a game for your class. Kind of cool, huh? Here's what some of them look like. Jim Matthews in Madison built a game called Dow Day. All he did is took photos from the Dow Day, uh, which is Dow Chemical was hiring for jobs in Madison and that in, during the Vietnam War and there were protests and everything else. So he thought, boy, we have these rich spaces that haven't changed since the 60s. I want my kids to see those spaces like they looked in the 60s. So he took a series of photographs. He would get kids to stand in a location and then pop up the photograph and then tell the story. And what happened is he got people even outside of his classroom that wanted to play this game. And Dowdy is a, a pretty cool little game. You can kind of go through that whole day. And he integrates primary sources into it. Only now you're not doing primary sources for school. You're doing the primary sources for fun. Like, wow, they actually wrote that. They should do that to those students. Um, so it gets to be kind of an engaging thing, and it's a neat thing. Down in uh, New Mexico, uh, teacher Chris Holden decided to do the same thing when he wanted to look at languages. And this would fit into that category of additions. He built a game with Eris where students go into the Spanish-speaking side of town and buy groceries and go to the post office and do all these basic functions of life. And then the Spanish helpers were built right into the game. 
so the kids could actually do what they needed to do when they walked into these spaces and understand what they said. So he would take them to places where there was a street sign and he would start translating those street signs and telling the stories about the local community they lived in. Now these are things that wouldn't necessarily interrupt Chris's normal classroom experience, but they're additions, they're add-ons. I would suggest that these add-ons build and they lead to something. They lead to comfort with games in the classroom. But they do it in a nice way. Instead of asking teachers to integrate World of Warcraft into their classes, I think great entry is to just be comfortable with games as a media format, not as something we think about as kind of a one genre thing. There's different kinds of games. Start to learn about which games are out there. Be literate in games. Um, and when you do that and you start to build comfortable with it, you start to see some of these really cool experiences. So I want to show you one. There's a young lady at, um, who studies at Harvard that built a mobile game. And you'll notice a couple things in this video I'm going to show you. One is that she simply has a map where she plops little buttons on the map. The GPS can know when the person gets to that point, And then, boom, up pops little stories, either text stories or audio stories that were built. So, and she did a nice little promotional thing to show it. This is the story of, of Webster and Parkman. Has anybody seen this? OK, good. You'll, I think you'll enjoy it. History is jazz. You've got the main groove, but also these in between notes that make the song memorable. Webster and Parkman were kind of a savage series of notes thrust into the middle of a cheery 19th century intellectual awakening. Webster, an ambitious Harvard professor aspiring to the highest circles of Boston was accused of killing Parkman, an old Harvard classmate, disappointed doctor, and son of the richest man in Boston. Gruesome body parts were found hidden around Webster's laboratory, and an O.J. Simpson-like trial ensued, which captured the attention of the world. There's a classic PBS film about the case called Murder at Harvard that I started watching a lot. The film was all about one historian's quest to get behind that closed door and figure out what actually went down between Webster and Parkman. Most of the events happened here in my backyard, Beacon Hill. And after hours in archives and antique shops, I accumulated various keys, clues that unlock that laboratory door in different ways. Walk with me into my collection along a mile stretch in America's loveliest neighborhood. I'm sure you'll never see the polished brass, the stately glass, and these old stones the same. You can start or stop at any of the eight points on your map, but the story really begins at the hospital, in its central dome, hidden atop Massachusetts General's oldest building. Go to the map section of the application to find your way there, and once you get there, Press wax seal number one to begin. This is my favorite part right here. Oh, and now it's wax. I don't know why I like, I've liked those ever since that Dan Brown book. Isn't that cool? Um, she's taking history and doing whole new things with it. Um, and she's creating her own meaning of what happened in those spaces. She's going, do you catch that she's going to antique stores to find artifacts? and primary source materials at libraries, and that she's watching a movie again and again and again in order to get the story down for herself. So she's using print text, she's using movies, she's using her own video camera to put together this snazzy little thing. And admittedly, she's a Harvard student, so they're smarter, right? Um, and so she's doing, this is exceptional work. But could students build their own games and start to bring those in as products for classrooms without you having to know how to do it? Sure they could. We've put tutorials on the Eris thing. Just tell them to go there and figure it out. And you're actually helping them learn some 21st century skills when you tell them to go there and figure that out. And the ones that do can start to teach each other. So I would suggest that even if you're not a gamer, there's some great open doors here for doing games as additions to your classroom. Let's go to level two. Okay? And that's kind of how we're going to go through this. I also think there are teachers that are bold and brave that actually bring games into their classroom. Now here's what's interesting. One of the resistance points we saw even two years ago is teachers would say, I only have 50 minutes in my class. I don't have a block schedule, therefore blah, 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 blah. And what we're starting to see is that there's some teachers that have figured out that whole 50 minute per class thing. And what they're finding is that 
if they just have the game be the teacher, it doesn't work. What works is when the teacher is the teacher and the game is simply a supplement in their class. Does that, that make sense, right? It, and it takes researchers like me to figure that out. Aren't you glad we exist? Um, so they, um, they're discovering that paper butcher paper tag board and things like that help kids to make meaning. And, and what you're going to see at the end of this section is an example of a teacher using these things in class, what it looks like. But the game simply becomes something that amplifies a field trip. And you put it on top of the traditional lesson. You let them use their notes on it. They work collaboratively together to solve problems. But those problems may or may not be in the game itself. They might be outside of the game. So games as supplements. One more tool to throw into my classroom. Um, the place where we started to define this was out in San Diego. I went on a field trip with a teacher and their kids. This school outlawed cell phones, and they could, kids couldn't use them. They weren't supposed to have them or anything like that, which was interesting. But I, th this was supposed to be an interactive field trip that I was going on. I was a little disappointed on the bus ride, because as soon as we got off the bus, the teacher started handing out these green sheets of paper. And every kid that came off the bus got a green sheet of paper. And I, and I got one, because I waited till last. I was polite. That's what my mother told me to do. And I read it, and it was simply a bunch of these little trivia questions about the animals around the park. And these were high school kids. Well, I thought, well, and, and so I asked the teacher, what are you doing with this worksheet? What are you trying to get out of it? Well, I can't just have them running around all day. I want them to learn something while they're here at the zoo. And that's the whole point of coming to the zoo. I, oh, that, that makes sense. That's good. So I started kind of walking around myself and came across a group of kids within two minutes of leaving the bus that ran around a corner and got out of sight of the teacher. And they sat down and started doing this. So I, I just came up and they thought I was kind of school police and I said, I'm a researcher. I'm just here to watch. It's just, I'm interested in what you're doing and are you guys supposed to have those phones? And they're like, oh, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 I'm okay if you have the phones. Just tell me what you're doing. What are you doing with these things? And what they were doing was they'd split up the questions between them and decided to look everything up on Wikipedia and I said, well, how does that work for you? Aren't, isn't the teacher looking for something specific from those little plaques at the exhibit thing? And they're like, no, actually, when you do it off Wikipedia, the teacher thinks that we're smarter than the zoo and we get better grades for doing it this way. <laughs> well, that's interesting. So they split up the work. No kid at this table saw every question. But they're solving problems like gamer culture solves problems. You don't just try to do it by yourself. That's silly. Get on a forum and figure out what the cheat is. Let other people that are experts help you and inform you and teach you. In other words, they're seeking out expertise. That's a good thing, right? So they finished their paper within about 10 minutes, and then they ran around the zoo and did whatever they wanted. Um, so that's kind of where we start looking at what a games of supplements happen. My first point is this. Sometimes kids have already done this to your classroom. Uh, I, don't, I think this teacher was a great teacher, and, and I don't mean to say that they weren't. But they were missing something about game culture that their kids already understood. Sometimes, be, uh, right underneath your nose, kids have already turned your class into a game. And they're doing it very well. And they're probably the kids you give the A's to. So there's the really simple review games. A lot of people in my field kind of poo-poo these, because they're, they're like, why, why, why wouldn't you just use flashcards, right? Um, and there's a ton of these games. If you want to see like 1,000 of these games in a few seconds and you're on a laptop, just type in like, video games for math in a Google search and hit the top one. And it'll be some site that has a 1,000 math games for your kids. And I, I put these in this thing because I don't think that's a bad thing. I think just the, the intermediate nature of using a computer can be kind of exciting for kids and engaging. But I don't think it's the best that computers do. I actually think flashcards are better for that because you get the people-to-people -people interaction. Um, but there's review games out there, and they can be part of a class. A lot of teachers use these like when the kids get done with their work, they can go on the computer and play a bunch of these games. Um, and that's how I was introduced to a game like Oregon Trail, which was the first game way back in the 80s that did it a little different than the review card. Oregon Trail did something really interesting. They went from a review game to a play game, where what gets learned is the sandbox in which you play. So the designers of games have gotten really good at creating what they call a sandbox game. And they're actually thinking of the kid's sandbox. What they do is they build the borders, which should be as invisible as possible, because the sand is piled really high. And you throw toys into the sandbox, and the kids can do whatever they want with them. And games like this um, sometimes make us cringe, because one of the options in a sandbox is to take the magnifying glass and burn the ants. Right? Grand Theft Auto does that. But do you learn something about solar energy when you do those things? Yeah. The other games do the same sort of thing, but give us a much more happy feeling, like the game Flower. If you've never looked at that and you teach science, it would be an interesting game for you to play with, where your job is to be the wind. Think about that. And you carry pollen and make the flowers bloom.
And, and it's really, it's one of those games that just makes me happy on the inside when I play it. And I get a real warm, fuzzy feeling when I do it. The other game like that is World of Goo. And don't even ask me about that one. You, that one you play with oil goo balls. So here's another level that my advisor, Kurt, likes to really look at. Not only can you play games as a learning experience, but you can also have teachers and students designing games as a learning experience. And here's what that might look like. like if you ask kids to be designers, to design anything within a sandbox or within a simulation or within a space means that you understand what you're designing. So if the goal is understanding, not just comprehension, let's skip comprehension and go right to understanding and have them design what you're going to do. This may mean you take any subject, subject that you teach and you simply make the assignment, I want you to design a full-on computer game that teaches this content. Give them the content you want them to learn that you thought you were going to spend three weeks on and give them one week to design a game. Then give them the identical test that you, just gave, that you used to give them for the three-week unit. And you'll notice that you can actually teach some things faster when you do this because the learning happens quick. And I'm going to come back to that story in our fourth layer, so to speak. One great example of this, and I think this is exciting, organizations like Discovery, which is in your uh, uh, exhibit hall, and National Geographic, and the National Science Foundation, and NASA, and some of these folks are really liking the idea that if they can help design the sandbox, they can decide what toys get put in there. Now, schools have always not only helped to educate, but they've also helped to protect our culture. If you're not aware of how games get designed and how that works, you will get games that maybe don't go the way you want them to when it comes to culture. Other organizations are part of making some of these games too, and they have agendas. So you should be aware of those agendas in the same way that when we learn to be teachers, we learn to understand the bias in a textbook, right? And we learn to teach. We, we still use the textbook, but we can now teach and, and, and address that to some degree. The JSON project is, um, the idea is multimodal integration. That means you're taking a ton of different modes of media and exposing kids to all of them as you teach. So there's print media, there's fiction, nonfiction, there's poetry, there's art, there's video, there's radio, and there's games. JSON Project has these four units, which are free. You can grab them right now. If you teach science, any of these would be a great asset. I actually think some of them would be great for social studies classes um, because of how they do it with all those multiple modes of integration. Um, and when you see this happening with, with teachers, you see that there's something good here, something so good that it would even like be like Chuck Norris approved. right? So, um, and this is, I think, one of the things that I get excited to show off to you, too. So let's do another quick uh, show and tell here. Uh, oh, wait. I'm sorry. I don't want to do it quick. This time I want to set you up for this video a little bit. I want you to watch how the teacher sets up the lesson. Okay? I also want you to watch how the teacher uses a resource model. Think of a sandbox again. When you look around the walls at this classroom, every wall is a resource center for the kids in this classroom. And we've known that for years, that that kind of having just stuff around the room is exciting. Um, that's part of the curriculum for the Jason Project. So there's these Montessori-like resources. There's also this idea that she pairs students. Um, a lot of times we have students do things individually, and there's a place for that. Um, if you're looking at games in the classroom, uh, the idea of working solo is simply not part of the vocabulary, and which is where we get into all that stuff with cheating. Like, they don't understand that they can't just work with their neighbor on that. So notice how she does the pairing and how she encourages them to talk about the problems they're having and solve them. Her role is shifted. She's not the sage on the stage like I am right now. She is the mentor that takes a knee next to these pairs. Watch how she does that. Um, she has the students designing. We've talked about that already. She has data collection going on in this classroom, but it's not just learning how to collect data because it's on the standards. It's learning how to collect data because that's what makes this awesome. So data as something that leads you to awesome is a very game-like mentality. Uh, look at like Railroad Tycoon if you want to see that in a game in itself, that, that data can make the game more fun. Finally, what she's constantly doing in these classrooms, and this is where I think there's some professional development things going on, is that this teacher is constantly asking students to represent meaning from their experiences. How does this work? How does it happen? Um, and then she gives the kids these opportunities to show off what they've done that's really cool. Um, so she's going to do that. So let's take another trip inside of a teacher's classroom using these sorts of games. The curriculum that we're using is currently um, the Jason Project. And we're using their newest version of a program, Infinite Potential. 
which is all about energy and energy usage. And so we've been studying um, different types of energy, how energy works, and where energy is in their world. Today, they voted if they liked roller coasters or not. We start with a morning meeting to make sure that everybody is ready for the day. Do a little bit of pre-work of what we're going to study. So take a second to think about what did you enjoy about the field trip yesterday? Who would like to start? And we're going to have some conversations because I want you to think about what we learned in the balloon lab and how that can help you make a really good roller coaster. When you're working on the computers today and you're working on making your roller coaster, you might want to look up here because this might help you. Because you know a lot about energy from all of the labs we've been doing to kind of bring back that reflection that we did this lab and what was the purpose. When we were doing the lab, they were so excited about the lab that sometimes we lose some of the purpose. So for me, I like to go back with the students another a couple days later to kind of really gather what they learned. And I tried to relate it to how building a balloon rocket would be like building a roller coaster. Just don't go really far, right? They have less air in them. All right, so I'm going to play this for you, and I want you to get some ideas. Okay? And this girl did the same type of learning you did. What kind of energy does it have right now? Yeah, it's going down. I definitely felt some of the uh, physics that we had been talking about earlier today. I felt pressure, and I stayed glued to my seat regardless of whether or not I held on. You're going to want to go to Coaster Creator, and that's the game that has you build a roller coaster. You can make them really big, but I'm going to not add a loop. I'm going to add a hill that goes down a little bit because I don't know if it will have enough energy. Okay? And then I can click on it again, and I can make a loop if I want. Think about the force that holds us down. Gravity. Gravity. And our height. That's how we figure out our potential energy. They could spend 40 minutes in pairs working to create roller coasters. If it has too much energy, it's going to crash. Why don't you switch and see if one of you can create it using Stephanie to learn from. You could see them asking each other questions and working together and trying to figure out how to build a roller coaster. And then when their roller coaster got stuck or when their roller coaster crashed, how they could troubleshoot. And I think that was my favorite part, is seeing them talk to each other and be like, you need to make the hill higher. Or you have too much energy at the end, you need to make another hill. Seeing them work together and giving each other feedback that related directly to the curriculum was what I thought was the most powerful and showed me as a teacher where they are in their understanding about energy. Can you get it to work? Three times. At first it crashed and then the second it um, got stuck and then it kept um, getting, it kept crashing and it got stuck. We had to, to uh, make another hill, then another hill, and we needed like a little straight little path, and then I stopped. And it was a success. So that's, we've gone through additions. Computer games is additions. Computer games is supplements to the class. And I, I, I hope you're getting a glimpse of like how cool what I do is. I really enjoy seeing these sorts of things. And those two boys where it got stuck, remember them? Like, they spent the, most of the 40 minutes trying to destroy roller coasters in the most phenomenal ways they could. They also, I think, knew the physics better than anybody in that room because they were at the point where they were playing with the physics, uh, which becomes a different kind of thing. Ready for another layer? I think that if teachers are playing with games as additions and if they're starting to play with them as supplements, I think they're going to fail at first. If you're a principal in the room and you've got a teacher wanting to try some things, you have to encourage them to try those things. Because as teachers, we don't think there's room to fail. And we're not going to get some of that pedagogy down right away, but we have to experiment and play with it and try it. Um, and the Jason Project is a nice way to enter into that. If you teach science, if you teach social studies, you might want to look at iCivics. If you teach math, you might want to look at Scratch. If you look at English, there are a ton of great applications that actually make writing a book into a game and doing some of those sorts of things. And, and I can uh, point you at some of those. Or you can look at uh, the Gaming Matter website where we have by um, subject clicks where you can look at lists of games to play. And those have been built by teachers that have been kind enough to share. But let's look at something else. If those things happen in the next few years, we should expect that there'll be some of these teachers, not all of them, maybe 1% of them, that will start to ask a new kind of question. What if we took games that I've been using as additions and supplements for years now, what if I took that and I redid my whole class? 
What if I made my class into a game? This is where it gets kind of exciting because we are seeing those kinds of teachers. Let me introduce you to a couple. The first is a guy named Lucas Gillespie in South Carolina. And he's paired up with a teacher named Peggy Sheehy up in New York. And they've decided that they're going to take their game as addition, their after-school club, and they're going to actually teach English with it because they felt they were getting better results after school with using World of Warcraft, which, by the way, is this sort of thing. Um, they were getting better results with writing in their after-school thing than they were in their classrooms. And Lucas works with special ed students. Peggy works with you know, the high achieving sorts of suburban students. And, she, and then what they were seeing in some of the writing was that there wasn't a lot of difference. So when kids are interested in what they're doing, lo and behold, they perform at much higher levels. In fact, Steinkuhler at the University of Wisconsin is releasing a report this year that shows that she had students that were labeled as low-functioning readers, reading six and seven times six grade levels above their reading level when they were trying to figure out their games. Because they would go onto the forums, and those forums actually have a high degree of college-level reading that you have to sift through to get there. So the trick is to get them in there. So uh, Lucas does something that's really interesting with games. Again, it's not just the game that teaches. It's Lucas's ability to help the kid transform that game into other kinds of meaning. So what he asks the students to do is every 15 minutes, he'll shout out and say, OK, Twitter. And the kids have to jump, they have to window their game, jump out, and they have to just write one line as to what they're doing in the game at that moment. What happens as you go through the quests of this game is that those every 15 minute Twitter feeds make an outline. Now kids that used to have trouble conceptualizing an outline for a story can actually write their own stories in the game. Not just the game's quest lines, but because it's a sandbox, kids can do anything they want in that environment, and then they can write stories about it through their Twitter feeds. So they leave the game, they come back to their Twitter feeds, they just sort it by their own character, because they've made their own character, and then they can use that as an outline to write not just a one-page paper, but entire novels. So he's getting this out of middle school age kids. So he's using it in a fairly genius way, don't you think? and it meets his needs. I would suggest that in the next year to two, we're going to see more and more of these teachers popping up like popcorn, and we're going to get more and more great ideas for how to use games in class. And our only hope is that we can keep track of it and start working those into our professional development. Here's another one. Uh, let's take a look inside Quest Atlantis. In Indiana, a group of researchers uh, worked with a group of teachers to take a whole science curriculum, and let's make our class into a game itself. The game is to go into Quest Atlantis and solve an awful problem for any Atlantean, which is water pollution. So if you live in Atlantis, water pollution's bad. So you need to try to figure out with your team of other students uh, what's going on, how it's going on, and you need to research it. What they tried to do is make a sandbox that was as authentic as a real scientist would have to go out and explore things in the real world. So they take water samples, they do all these sorts of things, and this is going to be where we go on our little field trip, and we'll take a peek inside Quest Atlantis. So here's a little sample. Games have a really interesting ability to take really complex activities, and if you scale it in right, they become really easy activities. Notice at the end, is that hard? She's like, no, this is easy. I'm just figuring out OTAX code. Um, so when you do that the right way and you start designing them the right way, they become really, really easy. So I'd suggest to you that these are kind of building. They get more and more involved. But I think that, and I've actually heard people stand up and tell teachers they need to start redesigning their whole classes. I don't think that's where I would want to start when I was a teacher. I'd want to start with the additions and the supplements and play with those a while and get comfortable with them. Because what if this girl isn't having an easy time? What if she gets stuck in the middle of, I'm reading this, I got this, I got my code here. Like as a teacher, you're just like, uh-huh, 
uh, yeah, uh, ask Johnny what to do with that. Because you're not familiar with the game, you're not comfortable with it. Suddenly there's this discomfort there that you'd almost just say, I don't want to do games. That's, uh, that's just not my thing. And now you've just not my thinged for the next 20 years if you're a young teacher. And you've really taken yourself out of what's some, some really exciting kinds of curriculum that might be coming up. Um, these sorts of things are capturing the same tools that game designers use. On the Quest Atlantis, they actually brought in game designers, uh, which are, it's really neat. It's a population of these people that never thought they would be extremely wealthy, so they're kind of looking to give back at this period in their lives. And they're like, yeah, I'll help with some education game design. Let's rock education. So you get people like Bill Gates actually interested in education, but he's not alone. There's a lot of people in this industry that are finding more and more time to just kind of do cool stuff. Uh, Google's got a really interesting business model where they ask their employees to just take 10% of their time and fudge around with things and make stuff up. Well, a lot of those employees are like, I think this would be really cool for school. Like, I'm going to send this off. So they actually have a business model that allows their employees to design and, and, and innovate some new things. When, they, when you put any of those people together with a teacher, some really incredible things start to happen. And, and it's hard to show you Quest Atlantis without letting you play it in like a workshop. But it's a pretty interesting kind of space for kids to play in where the meaning isn't about axes and swords. The meaning is actually about some pretty relevant scientific tools. And that gets to be kind of interesting. Um, I think there's one more layer that we can add to what games would look like in a classroom. Um, and for me, this is the most exciting kind of layer. Um, and part of what I'm uh, looking to find those sorts of teachers that are popping around doing this. Changing my curriculum and taking my whole class into a curriculum, I don't think that's better than using games as additions or supplements. I think it's different. But I kind of liked the face-to-face -face thing with kids. I don't really, the girl looking at the computer screen all hour, that would kind of get to me after a while. I went into teaching because I like people and I want to be with people. So I really like, I almost think sometimes the supplement stage is more interesting because they're integrating it with what they already know how to do well. So we have expert teachers. Let's let them just integrate a new media tool into their already established expertise. So sometimes I think, depending on how it's done, additions can almost be better than curriculum. But here's something that's kind of interesting. What if education actually looked at pedagogical design? So we trained our teachers in the same ways that they train game designers. So as teachers are designing with all those additions and supplements and curriculum, they actually are making informed choices about how to design things accordingly. This looks really different when you start looking at games as a pedagogical model. For starters, you have to train teachers. And I do whole sessions where we train them about the 11 game mechanics. All games today are built on about 11 core premises. Let me just show you five. Uh, and these are, um, you know, if you want to invent something from World of Warcraft to Farmville to you know, fantasy football leagues and that sort of thing, those digitally interactive kinds of spaces all kind of have the same sort of things going on. And they're not that hard. That's what's pretty interesting. It's like any teacher can learn this because they're already designers. So they speak design sorts of languages. Let's just show them what those mechanics are. First of all, in a game, you can expect, if you're a gamer and you speak that language, you can expect that there will be little rewards or points or sparkly stars that make you happy every time you do something right. You can expect that the consequences of failure are really minimized. Just fly through them real quick. Two, you can expect that there are levels to attain in this game and that that progression has benefits for your character. So when you play it, you get more access to things you can do. Can I invent my own assignments, Mr. Dickers? Well, sure you can. You've earned level four in my class. You can now invent your own assignments. Um, number three, there are things to collect. I love this one. Things that I can gather that mean nothing. Uh, in our book, Real Time Research, that we put out last year, we had 13 different groups of designers go out and do whatever research they wanted to for three days. Just to, We made research into a game because we were trying to play this out. Um, and one of the groups went off interviewing people that played a massive multiplayer on game, and they asked the question, do you have anything that you collect that means nothing? You just collect it because you think it's cool to have it in your bags. No, uh, no benefits in the game, nothing like that. Almost all of the people they talked to had little things in their bags that meant nothing. And they thought it was great that they had a shovel of power in their bags. <laughs> Number four, um, customizability. And, and you will hear, um, I, I remember when I was first training to be a teacher, they were talking about differentiated instruction, outcome-based education, yada, yada, yada. And we tried it, 
and it was hard, it took a lot of time, it took a lot of energy, but with computers, we've found even within the last five years, we can make this customizability thing happen, and we can do it pretty easy. The first level at which is that you let people make their own character. What if we did that in a classroom? You get to make a character that goes through my class all year. And as the year goes on, I'll give your character gear, and you can dress your character up if you want to. Those sorts of things are really easy to do. And with about a week of training, people can start doing flash mods. And, and you should expect to see these applications come out for teachers fairly soon. Let me give you the fifth one. This one's tough. Real-time systems for feedback. And there are, this is a real problem. But when this problem gets solved for education, I think the revolution that Sir Ken Robinson talks about will start to happen. As soon as we figure out how to give teachers simple tools where they don't have to be programmers to use it, to start modifying things for feedback and giving that feedback as students do things, that's really powerful. When you use games as an addition to your class, those games have those systems built in. We know how to build them. We just need to find the resources to build them for schools. And there's folks like Chris Deedy that's working on like a dashboard for teachers where you can kind of see what's going on with your kids in real time. You get to school in the morning and you'll have these 10 kids you need to talk to about this and it's all automated for you. Then you can start to do things like differentiate instruction in powerful ways. So as designers, you know how to do this. But I'm going to just flash up some questions. Good designers ask these questions when they see these principles. So when I look at my classroom or my curriculum, if I'm looking at a curricular level, I start to ask, or the students, the gamers, would start to ask, how do we build things in your classroom? How do, wh what do I do in your classroom that has any meaning for me when I leave your classroom? Do I take anything with me from here? There's a huge disconnect for a community of digital natives that speak this language when everything they do builds for some other level in the future. And what your class gives me is one letter at the end of the quarter. Um, does this build for next year? Do I have teachers? So schools have started to play with this where they have looping, where they have teachers that go with kids through the system. So as you build reputation with your teacher, it actually stays with you a little bit longer. So those sorts of things start to come into play. Um, how do I progress in your classroom? How do I get levels? How do I get better than my friend who thinks they're better than me, but I can prove I'm better by geeking out on your class more? There's a downside to this. When I started doing portfolio instruction in my classroom, I would give kids a challenge, like your portfolio needs to be, well, like in the class you saw, they're building roller coasters. But when I build a roller coaster, I can get a roller coaster up to a certain speed for a certain amount of time, and no one else in the class might be able to do that. So how do you grade something where there's a clear measure of performance, but what the kids really want to do is just show how awesome they are. They don't really care if they're competing to do it. They just want to show off that they built a great roller coaster, like the two boys that could destroy roller coasters with the largest impact and the most deaths. Well, that's a form of being able to brag something up and say, I'm really good at something. I've earned master's level. Um, we tested this out a little bit in a geography class. Um, I basically told kids there was a test that they could take, but it was voluntary. We called it the Grand Poobah Super Duper Mr. Dickers Challenge. Totally voluntary test. It was every major city, water body, landform, and country in the world. And it was a giant test, and they'd have to come in on a Saturday morning. We made it as hard as possible just to see what would happen. But what happened was, the first year we had a few kids that did it, and we had a few more, and then kids started coming into the class at the beginning of the year saying, you're Mr. Dickers, and I've already started studying for your test because we were expecting kids to fail this test. Now that flips education on its head. Why would you design something that's made for failure? Well, if it's for fun, then it's not failure, it's testing and experimentation. If you, keep the, if you minimize the effects of the failure, games are really good at motivating kids even though they fail again and again and again and again. If you don't know what that means exactly, if you're not a gamer, go play a game like Halo and see how successful you are. There's a certain language that you need to speak to do this sort of thing, which is why playing with it or doing it as an addition might be a good entry point for teachers. How can I personalize this to make my character build up my things? Those are key questions for gamers. How do I engage with the community is another challenge because we have privacy laws around school. We also have entire companies coming up where you can have private forums for your classrooms. Um, and you can do these sorts of things for free. 
So we started asking these sorts of questions. And before we were going to do it with any classrooms, we did it with the research world. And we did that, what I talked to you about. We had 13 different groups of researchers have a three-day game that they played where they could go try to ask anything you wanted. One of the things in research is it takes about a year to put a grant in. And then if you get the grant, you got about a year to do it. And then if, once you do it, you have about a year or two to publish it. So any research project has like a four-year cycle to it. So we just said, what if we just make this into a game just for fun, and we give them three days to do entire research projects? We just get smart people together, and we let them work, and we do it. So we asked those questions. We redesigned it. We made it into a game. And what we found out were two things. One, they actually came up with really interesting, valid research in three days. They could speed this up dramatically from four years. The second thing we, and there's those, thir those 13 studies are in this book. The second thing we found out is that this was a really neat redesign of curriculum for anybody that has to teach anyone how to do research. This was a great way to teach research. So we provide a deck of cards where you shuffle the cards and the researchers had to deal themselves a hand and then that was their study. They had to figure out how to do a study on those sorts of things. So the simple ability even to do non-digital transformations of curriculum, to me, is really exciting because then you don't have to have a half million dollar budget to build a computer game. You can use the same mechanics to do non-digital transformations of a curriculum. All right, I want to show you a couple samples, though, that aren't mine. One way of doing this, again, and, and this was the, the pushing the very non-digital version, was Lee Sheldon's class. And he's either in Illinois or Indiana. All he did was took the language of points, tests, and projects and changed the language to gamer language. Sat down with some of his students after school and turned his projects into quests, his points into experience points, and had challenges for students, and tests were called boss monsters. That's it. Non-digital just changed the language up. And it was like when you go to another country and you discover someone that speaks your language. He saw the same reaction. Students were like, oh, I speak this language. I know quests. I know experience points. I know levels. I know what all that is. Lee has reported out that his grades, uh, he hasn't really done much for the curriculum. But the performance of the students has been transformed. The motivation, the class attendance, the, um, the grades themselves have started to go up just by changing language so that we're speaking the same language that 97% of our kids are now speaking fluently. Here's a digital way to look at that sort of thing. In New York last year, they opened a school called Quest to Learn. How many people have heard of this or didn't do it? Good, I'm in the right room. All right, Quest to Learn is a whole school built on this idea that we can take education make it into a game and have some good results out of that. What they felt was that most people that rise to expertise in their field, at some point in their youth, they were simply playing with those things. So engineers played with Legos and writers were playing with short stories. That kids start to dig into things through play first and then go on to expertise. So what if you built a middle school around that idea? So that's what Quest to Learn is. Some of it's digital, some of it's non-digital, but the idea is that the kids become designers. So once they finish one thing that they've designed, they start designing their next game. So they move through levels in the school based on the designed games that they create, and they cover all the curricular areas, and they do everything. This is interesting. It's only a year old, and the proof in the pudding will show up here in a year or two when they start to get test scores back, because they have to take the same standard tests that you do. But they're throwing out the window this idea of checking 29 things off a list as you go through a year. Disconnected things that don't necessarily have meaning. They're banking on the idea that kids learn so much faster by being designers than by being learners, that that's something that they can use in a school. So the initial reports are that the teachers there are very excited about using some of these tools uh, where kids are designing computer games. And by the time they're done with seventh grade, they're actually programming code into computers. But they're learning about the digestive system because they're making a game about poop. Okay, So um, that's how they do that. They also play games because to be a designer of games, you need to play a lot of games. So they play games that are the sorts of games I've been showing you, Quest Atlantis, the Jason Project, Scratch, so that they're learning how those things work by being natives to that environment. Last but not least is shameless self-promotion. I'm really excited about something that we're doing kind of on the side because we want the freedom to do it as a game. But let's take all of American history and turn it into a, a game. Instead of necessarily telling kids they have to memorize things, because history is, you know, if you read Lowen and that sort of thing, social studies is one of those most turned off subjects for a lot of kids. But what if we said, no, no, this isn't a subject, this is your adventure. 
So kids get to take on a role or make an avatar, and they choose a character class. And with that character class comes a whole different set of assignments than what the person next to them has. And they play together. So a cartographer might team up with a scientist, or a, a, a craftsman might team up with a, a writer or an artist to start building things throughout the curriculum. Here's the other idea. What if we didn't just make games for students, but we turned this into a game for teachers? So teachers, in designing their curriculum for the year, we ran into this problem right away, which is why we're doing this kind of under the radar, is that uh, curriculum companies want a book where we can go through each of these kinds of standards because they want to control each day of learning for 30 kids at a time in these environments. But if you even go to the character class idea, suddenly you're not, you, none of your kids are on the same agenda, right? So you need this huge bank of ideas and projects and things kids can do and resources in order to provide this kind of learning experience. Not only that, books are great. In fact, there's tons of primary source materials out there. This accesses all those multiple modes of communication. So it looks a little bit like some of the things you've seen today. Um, we wanted it to where teachers could simply drag and drop some of these things and make project lists for kids, but that experience would be like playing a game. So we want to try to build something that would be sort of integrated into this. So there's these sorts of things. And what we're, what we're sorting out right now in the field when it comes to games in schools is we have a lot of different layers that we're looking at. It's not just let's play some games. How do you play games? What do you look like when we play games? What are these teachers that have done this for a few years? How have they redesigned their classroom in order to do this well? And those are the sorts of questions that hopefully next year I can start to share with you, because we're going to spend all spring going around the country and visiting these classrooms. And we're going to start to draw some conclusions about that. What do those things look like, and how do they work? What we do know is something to the effect of this. The earlier in the process of trying these strategies out, it tends to look like a developmental process. But I'm not a cognitive psychologist. I wouldn't even pretend to be. But we may want to start to involve some cognitive psychologists. Like, is this developmental? Is there some pattern to how teachers learn how to use these sorts of things? Um, the more teachers tend to use them, the more they want to go with these strategies because of the motivation they see, because of the deep learning that they start to see, and how that looks and works. So that idea of going out of these classrooms is called the 21st Century Teaching Project. And when we get that done, the idea is to start to look at professional development for teachers that would help them learn how to go through those stages a little bit quicker than just doing it on the job for themselves. So that's the state of gaming in the classroom right now. Um, I'm excited to say also that there's some really interesting things. Minnesota last year took a 5% sales tax increase. And they took, or it's not 5%, a half a percent. And they're taking that money and they're dumping it into their historical and art communities. So the Historical Society of Minnesota is going to start to build a new exhibit that would be interactive with kids, but they want to layer a game on top of that. This isn't even a slideshow, but I thought I'd tell you about this. So you would go to Fort Snelling Park, and there would be a game that you could play while you're there where you're collecting things. But that game would be linked to all other 15 historical sites in the state. So they want to layer the game on top of the game a lot like something they could do. Put it online so people can share with each other where kids can get titles and rank about what they've learned and what they've done. They can have folders that they take back with them to the classroom to start to do some of the things you saw in class today. And when we met on Monday, the conversation was about, well, could we build it in such a way that Wisconsin could just steal it when you're done? <laughs> and Iowa and Montana and Michigan? And could we start thinking about macro games for national park services or state park services where there's different places and things you can do where kids that don't like to go to historical sites but they do like to go hiking in a park, they can get a hiker badge where this kid gets the historical badge. Kids can start to build expertise through actual learning experiences in real places. Can we layer it in such a way that schools can have access to local community games that are learning experiences about their communities? And that's the sort of thing that's going on right now as we're talking with some of the things that you've been seeing here in this session. And hopefully in the next two to three years, you'll be able to access and start to use some of those things. And that gets to be even more exciting. For now, there's lots of games on the market. They do some awesome things. But that's a whole other session where we blast through a bunch of those great games. So thank you for coming here today. If you want this slideshow, it's, you can steal it. It's at Gaming Matter. 
Um, a, along with uh, the lists of various games for subject areas, we keep that all on that site. So a lot of times teachers are like, what are the first three games I should look at? If, you just, if I just played one game this weekend, what should I play? Those lists are on that site too. And there's my email address if you want to contact me or you're one of these teachers we're talking about, I want to come see your classroom um, and visit and meet with your kids and that sort of thing. I think we have a little time for questions, right? We're good? And I see one in the back already. Did you Google gaming matter as one word or two? Um, gaming matter.com, one word. Mm. Well, I could try to get there myself, but it was working as of this morning. If it's not working right now, I'll go home today and fix it up. Okay. Yeah, how many are there? Okay, go to the Minneapolis Ties Conference, and one of those two is the same presentation. Okay, then check this evening, and I'll fix it up. Sorry about that. Oh, good. Hopefully Google doesn't break. Um, yeah, she, if you press on the consulting, she says there was a, st a stopping point there. Okay, other questions? Yeah. You threw out a really quick list of names, uh, games by subject area. Are those on the Gaming Matter website? They sure are. Um, and that's something where every time I talk, teachers are like, just, I want like three games I can go look at this summer. So that was really built uh, by the teachers that I work with. Um, and I tried to keep it to games where I can actually go talk. Uh, there's a teacher that's actually using that game. Um, and so that's, uh, that's kind of exciting when you see those lists start to build and fill. So, yes? You gave us um, five parameters that games have, what are the other ones? The mechanics? Yeah. Um, you know, I could dig into that now, but I, if you go online and just look like at game mechanics, that's really pretty available out okay. there. Um, there's things like using life bars or, um, you know, how you structure levels. Like within the first five minutes of play, a kid should have a level. But then the next level comes after ten minutes, and then it's like a gambling. It comes less and less frequently. So there's those mechanics that are all ways to build those curriculum. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I'll be up here for any other questions. So.